Welcome to The Motivational Midwife. My name is Lynn Jones and today we have a really interesting talk from uh, Kim Stewart, around, uh, who is a midwife um, colleague and friend, around um, what it's like having a child with a metabolic disorder. Her little boy was diagnosed with galactosemia at just a few days old. So Kim, thanks ever so much for agreeing to talk to us. And I know you and I have worked together for many years. Um, but um, when your little boy was born, I know that he was diagnosed with a metabolic disorder. And I thought it would be quite useful for people to, uh, although you're a midwife, to understand what it's like um, having a, a child with a metabolic disorder and how that felt when you realised something wasn't quite right and how the maternity services did or didn't really support you. Yeah, no, thank you ever so much for letting us share our story because um, glatosemia was something I'd certainly, even in my professional role, ever heard of prior to us it being put around um, when my little boy was first born. Um, so it's really nice to actually be able to share what mm. what, what occurred. Um, it's a quite a rare, the, the facts and figures around how many people are actually diagnosed with it is a bit grey um, and it differs, it differs from country to country. Um, so here in the UK, we've got an instance of about one in 60,000 babies are affected by it. Um, and they're looking at around only 12 to 15 new diagnoses a year. Um, but thankfully, it's not particularly life limiting. Um, so there is hundreds of thousands of people living it with it across the, the UK. Um, and it still seems to be super rare and something that people don't really seem to speak about <laughs> I know like um, you I, I didn't know very much about it at all um, no and unlike until, America, until, until you until you had your baby <laughs> yeah and unlike America it's not part of our newborn screening so in America it is part of the blood spot screening and it, it is picked up on that but in the UK um, it's not part of that screening and actually um, it wasn't picked up on Elliot on his newborn blood spot anyway it was it, it was screened for later so, on when he presented what, being well I was going to say so what sort of things alerted you to the fact that he something wasn't quite right so he um he was probably five six days old um and we'd been in hospital anyway with jaundice when he was three four days old he'd had phototherapy treatment and it, his bilirubin had come back down so we were discharged back home um and then on day five day six he started becoming quite jaundice again um but still quite alert and then it wasn't really until day six day seven that we noticed he was slowing with his feeds um, and after each feed he started vomiting um, and it started off with only kind of little amounts but by kind of the end of day seven into day yeah probably in day in, into day eight it was just literally as soon as a, a drop of milk passed his mouth and I'd been breastfeeding we tried giving formula and different brands thinking that it was just that he, my letdown was too fast and that he was just guzzling so much so we only ended up really going back into hospital for breastfeeding support when he was eight days old um, and at that point they kind of said yeah I think it's your letdown let's just get you to express a bit before he feeds and then and then get him on the breast um, and he fed okay but literally as soon as we picked him up off the breast he vomited again um, and because he was looking so yellow, it was kind of suggested at that point that they do um, the TBR reading to see what was going on. And it came back unrecordable. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so they ten they took a, a kind of a blood sample and sent us off to Costa. Um, but I think in my gut feeling was that I knew it was going to come back high because they were like, oh, you can go back home if you want and we can just phone it. But obviously, if it is high you'll have to come back in and me and my husband sat there and we were like we're not going all the way back home because 
I know in my heart of hearts that we're going to be staying here tonight for treatment. Um, and yeah, lo and behold, it did come back um, kind of about half a line below the transfusion line. Oh, um, yeah. So we, we came back in for treatment and it was at that point then that they kind of started to get concerned about feeding because he'd lost I think it was about getting on for 15% of his body weight at this point, whereas he had been up when we were discharged home on day three. Um, so there was a few kind of alarm bells that started ringing, but there was a, a few kind of errors that had happened that I think were just not intentional, but there was some bloods, the bloods that had been taken at the point of the bilirubin for just normal kind of use and ease and things had all clotted but that message hadn't been passed back on so they weren't repeated until he was really quite unwell the next day um, and at that point then they realized that all of his use and ease were quite deranged and he was obviously quite dehydrated so we went down the route of getting him having an NG tube put in um, but even with with that literally as soon as whether you gave him breast milk formula milk of different brands as soon as it hit its stomach it came back up again <laughs> um and kind of we just were getting a bit of a loose end he was on the the phototherapy treatment and although his color wasn't yellow anymore by the next so day it would have been say would have been day nine um one of a, a colleague came to visit us who was a midwife as well and she said he's definitely not right this is not normal um and I think being a member of staff I think everyone wanted him to be well for me and that is no in no way a criticism to any of my colleagues because so they do you didn't... think it kind of blinkered um people to maybe looking outside the box earlier yeah, I think that I think they wanted everything to be OK. And I think there was so much of a focus on just trying to make him feed that there wasn't a thought as to why he wasn't feeding mm. straight away. And it wasn't until she came in and said, look, I'm not happy with this. And we'd had a bit of a miscommunication between. So a A&MP had come in and uh, reviewed him and said that um, she wanted him to go to NICU. Then one of the NICU regs came round and said, no, he needs to, he can stay here. We just need to do this, this and this around feeding. Um, and it wasn't until a colleague came in and said, no, I think we, we need to push to have it escalated above her or a different opinion that one of the neonatal consultants came to have a look. And literally within a few minutes, he was being taken round to NICU. And that was when he was, yeah, nine days old. And looking back through all of the kind of evidence that how galactosemia presents he is literally textbook um so usually between day seven and day 10 they start displaying jaundice reduced feeding vomiting weight loss um and then kind of more medically kind of clotting problems and it's not something that we'd really put any consideration to but every time he had blood stern and from his umbilicus that had been dried up was now constantly bleeding Right. Um, so if we, if we were thinking of women we'd be thinking DIC wouldn't we yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so it kind of I think all the little bits started to drop in into place and when they moved him around to NICU they said initially they were just going to kind of put him in a cot in one of the observation bays um and they asked us to give him a little bit of time to settle in which was fine um and then by the time we'd gone around there about 40 minutes later he was actually in an intensive care bed next to all the tiny he looked massive because I mean he was, eight, he was eight pound one at birth anyway um and yeah he had lost a bit of weight but he still looked huge next to this little 31 weaker that was next to him. <laughs> I was like you're not meant to be here <laughs> so um, how long did it take to to kind of determine that that's what the problem was and I mean it just just reminds me but it's a an intolerance to the lactose isn't it um it, so intolerance to the galactose. So it's a, a an element like kind of lactose and galactose kind of sit along side each other in terms of the fats and the proteins that are in dairy products. Um, and even if I had have been completely dairy free, we still naturally produce galactose in our bodies. So it still would have been kind of essentially it's poisonous to them. The enzymes that they need in order to break down the galactose just don't exist. The body doesn't produce them. So they're stored in the liver and the liver is unable to pass it out in the urine, hence why they become jaundice. Um, but what's different in the screening is it wasn't being picked up on your 
they look at normally your conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, um, it was coming up the opposite way. So they were finding that SBR wise, it was coming down, but actually the conjugated bilirubin was going, was going up. up. <laughs> um, and hence then I think that's then what caused his liver to be quite enlarged. Um, and that's what also caused the derangement to his clotting factors. Um, and what caused him um, to then bleed every time he had any sort of blood sand just from his umbilicus, because obviously it hadn't quite healed properly at that point. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a bit of a kind of weird one, but it did take them another probably three days really um, to start thinking that it might have been galactosemia. So the first, so it was a Friday that he was admitted to the NICU unit um, and they, it took him a little while to stabilise him, his temperature were up and down. And I think initially they were querying sepsis because he was presenting a bit like a sepsis septic baby in terms of that his temperature was a bit up and down. And all his, um, by this point, all his blood, blood work was completely deranged and they weren't really sure what was causing it. So I think they went down, they're giving him antibiotics and everything to, just as a prophylaxis. Um, but when they didn't see much improvement to that, the... Um, overnight their, his bloods continued to deteriorate so I think they came and woke us about 3.30 in the morning um, and said that they needed to give him the cryocipitate to improve his clotting factors um, and they needed to stabilise him enough to be able to transfer him down to King's in London where he could be then seen under the specialists. Uh, I think by that point they were starting to recognise that it was something kind of liver metabolic-y um, but they didn't really mention to us then until the Saturday. So that's when he was 10 days old, that realistically there was a chance that he'd need a liver transplant or that he wouldn't survive because they couldn't find out what was wrong and he was just deteriorating even more. Yeah. Um, it was a very, very scary time for you and your husband. Yeah. And I don't think, I think at the time, like anyone, I think you just go into full on, right, we need to do this, this and this. And we just, you just power on through and I don't think you really think about the things until after the event <laughs> yeah after anything um but thankfully one of the so I think she was one of the breastfeeding like the outreach breastfeeding team for NICU um and she's American and she happened to have a, a make a passing comment to one of the consultants and saying oh I bet that's it sounds exactly like galactosemia and apparently they all laughed at her and said no way it can't be that that's completely completely rare kind of mm. it can't be um I think it obviously just niggled at the back of a few of their minds when they were coming up short of what was actually wrong with him um and when they did reach out to King's kind of that was one of the suggestions that was made was that it was galactosemia um and that it can be screened for on a blood spot but it obviously hadn't been picked up on the blood spot we'd had taken on day five so they had to take another one <laughs> and the other one <laughs> Um, had to then go to Addenbrooke's and at this point we're on a like a Sunday afternoon and there's no careers <laughs> or transport anywhere um, so it, it took us another few days really to get the results back and whilst we were waiting for that confirmation they still continued with the treatment along the lines of kind of giving him vitamin k to help with that cl clotting um, they thankfully didn't have to give him any more of the cryocipitate because it did actually normalize his clotting factors relatively quickly they just continued with the vitamin k um and yeah and then by day probably 14. so how did they i mean in terms of doses of vitamin k and that then was it, are we looking at iv im um so they've given it iv as a, an infusion um to begin with and then they moved in once he then stabilized a bit he went then um they stopped giving it and just went to going with like multivitamin, like your Abidec type things, just to board spectrum it. And then it was only the antibiotics they continued with IV um, after probably day, I think they stopped the vitamin K would have been the Monday. So we would have been 11, 12 days old um, because he'd stabilized. And it was amazing really how quickly he actually responded to the treatment from seeing him on the Friday to then seeing him on the Monday um, the doctors that had swapped over, they couldn't believe the difference in him. <laughs> um, <laughs> they were like, he's like a completely new, it's like someone swapped him out with a new baby <laughs> that's not poorly anymore. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so it's amazing how quick he responded and hence why we managed to avoid being transferred down to Kings um, because Peterborough did an absolutely fantastic job at thinking outside the box and even just the basic of stopping him feeding. And I don't think I appreciated at the time them saying that, right, we need to stop all feeds and just put him on kind of IV fluids kind of was scary but actually in hindsight it was the best thing for him because it gave his body time to try and pass out what he could of the the galactose that was already there and then we didn't give him any more so um he managed to recover so going forward then how what how what impact did that have on on your sort of lifestyle when you did get him home so um whilst we were still in the NICU um we had to start feeding him with the soy milk um, to just avoid anything that was dairy-esque um, so I had to stop breastfeeding and then move over to soy milk um, which was a bit of a shock to the system obviously being a midwife I think you you always just presume that you'll be able to breastfeed and that nothing will will stop you from doing that and that's probably my naivety as a first-time mum as well <laughs> um, so it was a, a bit of a shock but and the unfortunately the milk that you had to have was only in powder form so it was a kind of steep learning curve into so I had to send my husband out to buy bottles because we were just like ah we don't need any of those things <laughs> <laughs> um, so um it was a bit of a shock having to learn how to do powdered milk and then obviously kind of making it up and preparing it all in in an environment that's completely alien really in terms of um we were in in a hospital setting and having to use all of their bits um, and he stayed on that soy milk then for until he was one. Um, and then when we started weaning, um, we we just have to stick and he would always have to stick to a dairy free diet. So um, essentially vegan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We say he's a meat, he's a meat eating vegan. <laughs> Bless him. So in terms of uh, how well supported you felt, um, you know, I mean, I know obviously you were a colleague um but putting that aside do you think that kind of helped or hindered the support you got um I think a mixture I think in maternity I was extremely well cared for which yes made a bit of a blinker I think in actually recognizing that there was a problem but I think once there was a problem I could not fault any of the care and the support that I received from anyone and even for Gary um, my husband because it was all very up and down one minute we were being told that he was fine the next minute he was whisked through to NICU and we were being told that we probably wouldn't get to take him home and if we did he'd probably need a liver transplant so I think I think then the, the, the it changed that they realized how poorly he was and I think the, the support that I got didn't change but I think the recognition that there was actually a problem and it wasn't just me being a paranoid mom in that he was spitting up his food every time um I think it, it changed a little bit um from a NICU point of view it was a bit mixed because there was a few members of staff that I knew and I felt like they just presumed I knew know what to expect in NICU so those first so when Elliot was first admitted to the ward at on the it must have been early afternoon on the Friday I didn't and actually touch him again until the Saturday evening um because no one told me I could open the incubator and touch him mm. and I know it seems like a really stupid thing I think but, the, but I think there is this assumption when you are um a nurse or a midwife or uh you know that you kind of know stuff yeah uh, and I think there is a bit of an assumption for us as professionals that people know things uh, and I think we need to take a step back and think, actually, I, I possibly need to just treat you like you don't know anything. And then you tell yeah. me different. If yeah. you know that already, then stop me and yeah. tell me. Um, yeah. Because we do, we do, I think, make assumptions that if you are a, um, a colleague, particularly, that you kind of know what's going on. But yeah. you've, got, you've got a newborn mum, you know, a brain yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And I've never had... I, I mean we've had minor dealings with NICU but it's certainly not a huge part of our role um so kind of yes I knew where NICU, NICU was I knew what beds were normal beds and cots and what bit was the intensive care bit I was like but I didn't know anything more around what you were allowed to do as a parent and what you weren't allowed because actually my capacity that I've only ever been in there was as a healthcare professional and I do think 
the area is different. It um, certainly is. It frightens me half to death. I could, <laughs> I could not do their job. I absolutely no. could not do their job. <laughs> no, but on there was only probably a, two or three people that were a bit kind of blasé about the fact that they knew I was a midwife and that I knew things. Um, but there were some, but they were outweighed by those that were outstanding and um, the care and the compassion that they have and like the fact that you know because ultimately you're leaving your baby in their care <laughs> that like you're literally walking out because obviously we stayed we were still on TC so we'd have to go back there to sleep and they were really good at encouraging us to making sure that we were going off and getting food and drink and that we weren't just sitting by his bedside which was really hard to leave him but really nice that they were actually encouraging you to look after yourself as well because I think it it could be very easy to get wrapped up in the fact that you're not leaving their side and neglect yourself. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. Now, he's he's three and a half-ish now, isn't he? So, uh, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, it, it, it all happened pre-COVID. So, you know, it could have been a very different landscape mm -hmm. to deal with that problem. So how, um, I know you said he started preschool now. So does yep. that present any... Um, specific problems for you uh yes <laughs> yes and no I think I think I'm always going to be super paranoid because children like to share which is lovely but Elliot's he's not quite at that age where he understands that he can't have certain things even though we talk about the fact that we have to check the packet or if you're not sure you need to take it to mummy and daddy to ask whether you can have it he's not quite fully grasped that yet and he doesn't think that if someone hands him something that he might not be able to have it and he'll just eat it <laughs> um, so but the I must admit every setting that we've ever taken him into um because he's been into a nursery a childminder and now a preschool um they have been really good at understanding what it is that he can't have um and like at the nursery they had his picture on the wall with what what allergens what his class does and that if he was to be exposed to something what would happen um and ultimately kind of I think we always class it as an allergen when we're talking to people we say he's got an allergy to dairy can't have it um because that's the easiest way to get the message across but ultimately if he was exposed to it um he's not going to have an anaphylactic reaction it's not going to kill him immediately like you would expect from an allergy um it's more that if he was to have a large dose of it it would kind of he wouldn't be able to break it down so you'd have those kind of initial upset tummy, tummy vomiting kind of diarrhea um lethargy and then if he continues to get exposed to it or is a, a larger amount then it puts that strain on the liver again and we don't know at what point that would tip him over to then needing destroying to the liver to the point that it would need replacing Okie dokie. So um, is there any sort of organisations and things, given that it's such a rare condition, that can support parents uh, of children with galactosema? Yeah, so I think so early, certainly in the early days, I think that was what we found difficult, is that no one really knew where to point us to, no one in the trust had experienced it. I think there was one doctor that had cared for a family that had got an older child with it, but that child wasn't born within the trust so they've never experienced it in a newborn so no one really knew where to point us to um so it was kind of a bit of a we'll sit and search the internet and see what we find <laughs> um <laughs> which was good and bad in, a, <laughs> in some mm. ways um but we did come across um and and it, we were pointed to the direction of a, a uk support group that's just called kind of galactosemia uk and they are a charity set up for the parents that set it up have children that are well, now adults yeah. <laughs> um, where children when they first set it up um, that have galactosemia and wanted to kind of find more people out there that had got it and help support them um, so yeah so kind of they were the biggest help and I was really fortunate that once I got in touch with those um, that a couple of mums reach out to, reached out to me um, and they'd all got children under kind of three at the time um, and I think the the youngest one was about 10 months older than Elliot. Um, so they kind of gave him, it gave me that kind of initial point of contact. Yeah. As to what and also could. a light at the end of the tunnel that actually your child could have a perfectly normal life. 
yeah because um, you do start reading into it and um glatosemia although it's not life limiting it's associated with quite a lot of developmental delays um particularly around speech about 89 percent of the children that have glatosemia will have some form of speech delay um and that can also link to cognitive delays in terms of kind of learning and development some people have experienced kind of problems with gross motor skills, walking, those sorts of things. Um, but because it's not so widely researched, it's there's not a lot of evidence to say how it's affected. Um, and they, it, it's quite clear that actually it doesn't matter at what point it was picked up, it makes no difference on the outcome of whether they are affected by those things. It's just pure potluck. You could have found it, known about it pre-delivery, and gone straight onto a dairy-free diet and they could still have speech and developmental delays it makes no difference whether they were exposed to dairy or not um, and they don't know they haven't found the link between them yet um, so it is scary when you first look at those things so but what we we, we were put in touch with then um, the Evelina hospital in London that's attached to Guys and Thomas's um, and they were kind of they've been the a, a huge support as well They've got a metabolic consultant there that we went to see. So we were discharged home from the hospital on the Sunday and we got in to see her on the Monday. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, yeah, she, the, it's like a multidisciplinary team that they have. So every appointment we go to, we have a consultant, a specialist nurse, a play therapy and a play therapist and a dietitian. Every appointment we attend um, and they give you all the information and they were the ones that then put us in touch well um kind of guided us towards temple um which is a organization that provide leaflets i think it's kind of leaflets for parents and for healthcare and support around metabolic disorders um yeah, i'll put got... the links to these um organizations in the description box underneath for people so they can get more information if they need yeah that's absolutely fine because there's lots of lots of metabolic dis disorders out there that I think we are completely oblivious to unless you're yeah. affected by it. Um, How often do you need to go for follow-up appointments with him? So initially we went monthly until he was six months old and then we went three monthly until he was a year old uh, and now because he's demonstrated everything as he should and his um, they screen his um, lactose levels to check that he's not being exposed um, so we're now yearly thankfully <laughs> well that's good yeah. Yeah, um, but we see we see a doctor every six months because we're seen at the Evelina, Evelina a year and then six months later we're seen by Peterborough by the consultant paediatric teams there just as a kind of in between um, so and then they are a year so it kind of alternates between the two every six months just to keep base touch base and check is they can be on the smaller side so it's just to make sure that he's still developing growing kind of doing everything that you should do that's fantastic is there anything else you think that would be useful for people to to know or any pearls of wisdom I don't think so I think it's I think it's really hard now being on the other side of it I think it's hard to be empathetic with someone when you've not been there so I think it certainly is it is difficult but I think it's just about remembering not to be dismissive of signs and symptoms I think because let's face it 98% of the time whatever the symptoms they are they usually are resolved without there being a serious underlying health problem but actually there's those few occasions where we are we can be dismissive and and think that it will all be fine when actually there is something more serious going on and I think that still kind of holds heavy to us is that yeah. maybe we could Got treatment earlier and maybe he wouldn't have been as poorly as what he was if those symptoms had have been taken a bit more seriously yeah it's a lesson learned I think for us in the profession yeah, <laughs> yeah and I think there's been a few babies since um our little one that have presented with galactosemia um at our trust anyway um and I know and that so that's been... it's interesting then because it potentially then the numbers may be rising potentially yeah because um, me and my husband are carriers of different variants which is oh. even <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's recessive as well so me and my husband both carry it we'll never be affected by it but we carry that 25 percent risk of every baby that we have that will be affected 
by galactosemia. Mm. So if you, uh, and you may not know the answer to this, so if you choose to have more children, will you um, be offered, um, you know, sort of prenatal screening? So yeah, so at the minute, the prenatal screening, the only way that it could be detected is on an amnio. Unfortunately, the, the gene that it's carried on is not like on the harmony screening. It's not something they can delve deep enough to find or whether that will change in the future. He, who knows with science, but at the moment it would have to be an amnio. Um, and kind of we have had the conversation that actually an amnio comes with a risk and actually yes. it's not it's not like limiting enough to the point that we would choose to terminate a baby if it was affected um, the only thing it really does affect is that when the, the baby would be born is it would have to have screening straight away and we would probably have to wait up to 72 hours to get those results back and in that time you would have we would have to use soy milk um, just to make sure um, but yeah it's certainly certainly something that we could you could get that prenatal diagnosis if you wanted to going down the route of an amnio but not anything less um less invasive. invasive yeah okay well thanks ever so much kim i really appreciate your time no worries thank, thank you very much for having me. i look forward to catching up with you later <laughs> yes <laughs> and there you have it um uh, an interesting insight into galactosemia so if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so. And also look out for us on Facebook at The Motivational Midwife. I look forward to seeing you next time.